Welcome, welcome to the show. A little bit past uh, 9 p.m. on the East Coast, but it is Monday, and Monday means I can stay up late, right? So I get to stay up late one day of the week. My handlers allow me to do that, and that day is Monday. And I know some of you are like, 9 p.m., Larry, that's that's not late. You are clearly an old man. And you would be right if you were to think that that would be accurate. Yes, I am clearly an old man. So, But no, I'm happy to be here. And I'm talking about something I think is very important. And that is the idea, and I think all of you, I'm sure you see it. The idea that right now a lot of us are angry at each other. We show a disrespect. We show um, a distrust of ourselves, our neighbors, uh, a distrust literally of our institutions and an anger that I think is really crazy. So I brought together on this awesome Sharp Club a star-studded panel, a panel of super cool, super awesome people. Well, most of them are at least, I know. Most of them are. If I could bring on it, if I could, she is a she's a, a, a former congressional communications director, she's a political commentator, the woman herself, Sarah Slop. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Of course, happy to have you. Also, is someone who I have actually been on stage with before. She is, do I call her an activist? Maybe, but she really is, she's an artist and a writer. And I'm going to say activist because I like how that sounds. So I'm going to say that. She may disagree. The one and only Salome Sibonet. How are you? I'm good. And I will take activist. That's fine. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I, I, I decided to call you that. And I have to bring on. Oh, hold on. I don't know if he's ready yet. I do have to bring on. Um, you know what? I do have uh, with me our returning champion, the man, the myth, the legend, political commentator himself, Michael Voss, but he's not ready yet. So I will bring him on in a second. Hold on, can I bring him on now? Hold on. Hey guys. He's not there yet. Okay, there he is. I cannot see you, Michael. Yeah, it's my camera. I'm fixing it right now. Just Okay, go I'm going to pull on. you out. Let me know when you're ready. Go ahead. There we go. But he's here, see? So I do have him here. It's actually true. What I, what I want to ask, and I think this is an important piece that I think all of you understand. There is a lot of distrust right now. And distrust... While a healthy dose of distrust is good for anything, right? Always a healthy dose is good. There's a distrust of our institutions now that I would say is bordering on unhealthy. In other words, when someone says, I'm from this organization, or I'm from this college, or I'm from this agency, a lot of Americans go, yeah, I don't buy it. I don't believe it. I don't trust you. And the example I'll give is, this is controversial, but people want to break up TikTok, right? What's one of the reasons why? Well, we're getting misinformation on TikTok, is what I said. They're giving us misinformation. In theory, shouldn't our president be able to come on TV, say that this thing is wrong, whatever the thing is, it's wrong, and then we go, oh, I believe my president, I don't believe TikTok. That is what should happen. But it doesn't happen. When the CDC says do something, we don't always believe them. When the FDA says do something, we don't always believe them. When a college professor says something, we don't always believe them. That wasn't true before. Sarah, am I wrong here? No, you're completely right. Ronald Reagan actually said this pretty spot on. Um, I'm from the government and I'm here to help are the scariest words any American could ever hear. Right, right. But, right. but, did we but when he said it back in the 80s, that was kind of controversial. Absolutely. And I mean, it's still pretty controversial now. If you think about it, like, let's go back to the pandemic for a second. When Dr. Fauci came out and started being hyper political with COVID, yep. everybody out of nowhere was saying, this is absolutely insane. Like, let's monitor it, but please stop intruding in my life. Meanwhile, there were um, there were some really, really great um, intellectuals going on TV, press conferences every day for months yeah. on Fox News. So you see both sides of the coin. We want to hear from the government, but please don't intrude on our personal space. Yeah, but I think that that adds to my division piece, right? Because there were mm -hmm. a chunk of people, and I live in New York City. 
there were a chunk of people who said, if Fauci says it, he's basically Saint Fauci, right? If he said it, clearly mm-hmm. it came from the Pope himself if Fauci said it. And there were people who were like, I don't care what this guy says. He's full of it. They didn't believe anything. Right. 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 Doesn't that help in the division? Salome, it actually, tell me. Let me get Salome in here for a second. Go ahead. Oh, good. <laughs> I defend it. I defend the skepticism. I defend the distrust. I think that it has been well earned by a lot of these institutions. Solomon, and can I need to turn your volume down a little bit. That's me, maybe. I can. No, no, that, that's Solomon. Can you turn your volume down? Is that possible a little bit? I'm not sure, but I can move. I can step back. How is that? Oh, that works. Still? Yes, perfect. Yep. It's perfect. the Cuban in me, <laughs> naturally projecting a voice. <laughs> But yeah, I defend the skepticism and the distrust. I think the difference is, is it destructive? Is it pathological? Is it knee jerk? Or is it constructive? And do we know why we're skeptical? Do we know what we are going to replace an institution with if we distrust it? Because if all we do is tear things down and don't have an alternative solution where, okay, but here's a better way. Here's a constructive option. Mm then we just stay stuck. And it is that kind of gridlock environment well, where I don't trust you, but also I don't have a solution. And so we're just stuck here. No trust, no building, no progress, no solutions. Right. Or even worse, I just yell, I can't trust you. So I'm just gonna believe the other guy blindly because I don't mm-hmm. trust you. So whatever the other guy says must be true. Cause I just, I'm so scared of you. Right. We see that always, don't we? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's that knee jerk kind of reaction where yes. I'm just going to run to the other side and play on their team and not question that. And at that point, you are just going to be the next version of what you already hate, which is someone that gets manipulated Ooh. and someone that gets used for malicious ends. So let me go one step further then, because now I think, don't we then push people there, right? If I Look, if you go back to the best example I can give you right now, the most popular one, I think, is Joe Rogan, right? Joe Rogan is not a righty. He's not, right? He just stopped being left and they made him right. Like he wasn't, he was supporting Bernie Sanders. The guy was like Medicare for all. And then all of a sudden, cause he doesn't like what Biden's doing now, all of a sudden now he's basically a Trumpster, right? All of a sudden now he's, he's MAGA all of a sudden. Like he's, the guy's not MAGA. I mean, he may not be a, a hardcore lefty anymore. That's possible. But he's not MAGA, and they've made him MAGA because, to your point, if I'm not this, then I got to be that. See, I think there's a little bit of a difference, though, about where this distrust, where the misinformation is coming from, the feelings. It all stems from knowledge first. When we have a lack of knowledge, we don't know what's really going on, where the core issues are, where the core values are, where the core conversations at. Well, then that allows them to then say, okay, let's em- emotionally manipulate you. That these are the bad guys. You don't know why, but they're the bad guys. And you're getting yes. bombarded with all the information saying, no, these people mm-hmm. are bad. These people are good. And you have to buy into that or we will punish you. You will be ostracized. But all of it comes from, but I don't know what's going on. I'll give a great example of that right now. Most people in America don't know, and I know you're going to hate me, Larry. 30,000, over 30,000 Americans have been abandoned over the last four years. In fact, 5,000 in 2021, another 10,000 in 2022, another 15,000 in 2023. And this year, it could be as much as an additional 40,000. Where is that? Afghanistan, Ukraine, Sudan, and now in Haiti not even counting Gaza and what's happening there, 34 Americans dead, 22 tortured and sexually abused as we speak. There's a lack of knowledge. No one knows that. And yet we're being told, but if you ask about it, you're the bad guy. You're supposed yeah, to be on the side of the Isn't there a secondary guy. piece of this though, right? How many people, Mike, to be forward, are gonna be able mm-hmm. to do as much as you are trying to do? Like, let me, I guess what I'm doing is I'm saying, isn't there almost an overload of inf- information? Like if I want to walk down a rabbit hole, I could go down a rabbit hole on Sudan and spend three days on Sudan if I wanted to, right? But I like how to go pay bills and work and stuff and have family and friends and stuff like that. So no. now I'm at a point where I can't handle it. So you know what I'll do? I'll just, I'll just, I'll just see whatever Salome is writing and whatever she's writing, I'm just going to believe her because no. I know her and I trust her so I, I can't go down a rabbit hole. 
she's my she's my famous smart talking head. When she says that Michael Voss is bad, I'm just gonna believe that he's bad. No, it's it's the fact is, yes, the ladies, you, everyone can be informed. You can't tell me they don't that the average person doesn't have enough time to double check on Google the news from last year. You can't tell me that. Not when they know what happened to the Kardashians. They can tell you about every one of the housewives of wherever the hell I don't care about. They can tell me mm. about Taylor Swift and whether or not she's going to have an impact on a football game. I could care less about not these wrong. things. And if they can tell me the details on all of that, they know the stats on every ball player, every entertainer. Yep. And you're going to tell me, oh, you can't figure out what was publicly announced in every so newspaper. Let me let me let me bring up a piece. Sarah, you were in this. You worked for a congressman, right? Yes. Clearly, when you work for a congressman, the congressional people are going to try to put out whatever words they want to put out, whatever data they want to put out, info they want to put mm -hmm. out. You had to be part of a team of people who were researching this and researching that and researching this. Were the people overwhelmed or no? Or was this a, a relatively easy job people could just knock out? So one of the big things I like to talk about when it comes to congressional work or Capitol Hill comms, you're always going to have a sense of um, familiarity with the political system. But when you go home or you talk to constituents on the phone, it's an information overload. Um, like Michael That's was what I'm thinking. Yes, exactly. So you get, for example, I read the Daily Mail a lot and they are so on the nose with a lot of the pop culture sort of things, but they're a later to the game um news commentary for political news but we are seeing so much on twitter we are like every 10 seconds you are getting something new from jake sherman from mm. politico or now punchbowl and it's at that point where i have this like this is what i live on this is my foundation in politics i don't care what side you're on as long as you're an educated voter and you're not necessarily regurgitating talking points you see on tv um or here on tv we are all guilty of that but at the same time there is a really big reason people run for office. They believe in the things that they are fighting for, working on, writing bills for, et cetera. Mm. And that goes down to the staff. If you don't have a staff that is up to date with all of this stuff at all times, it can get extremely overwhelming, but there, it is easier to craft the message if you know everything than to just you know go in completely blind. Like for example, the election. Sure, we're getting yep. things every five seconds about like, oh, sure. Biden just quote tweeted Trump. But the problem is people aren't necessarily looking at the polling on Real Clear or the data that says like mm. RFK Jr. is polling. I think as of last week, he was polling about at 10 points in the Trump versus Biden. So of course they want a third party option, but they don't understand or think to actually research why they believe in the things that they do to elect the congressman. Let me grab a couple, if I could, of Super Chats. I got a bunch of Chats. The, the, of the Lunatic Libertarian is doing a whole bunch of stuff. Abandon labels, titles, and categories. Human being. This is the part that I got to say he's on the nose. The problem is too many people label you, right? So do you work for a Republican congressman? Oh, you're MAGA, so I can ignore you. Do you vote right. for a Democratic, uh, do you work for a Democratic congressman? Oh, you're a socialist, so I could ignore you. And I think it does, a part of it makes it easier, right? I mean, if I mm -hmm. if I do the one word story on you and I call you the name, well, I, that's one thing I have to worry about anymore. Anything that, anything right. that, you know, that person says, I can ignore now and I can go someplace right. else. I feel like the system almost makes it easier for us to label, to, categorize people the system actually encourages this am i wrong well one of the big things that i actually talked about in a piece recently um if you are just saying on twitter you have a friend from home who isn't involved in politics at all if they retweet something from the party or a candidate then they are initially um initially related to the party or representative of that view True. so people are hyper focused yep. on not saying that because they don't want to be labeled or for example I... the perfect example if you this is something actually a lot of because i'm on the cusp of coming up in the tea party movement and then coming into trump i have a lot of friends who are more socially moderate because you know it made a little bit more sense for how we were growing up um and a lot of people that i know were scared to post squares um on for like oh, black lives matter that. on that day yes. we were scared it would affect their job 
And I so when that. I That's right. when I think of labels, it's that yes. because we all know we're good people, but if you don't have a personal connection with them, it's easy to label them as like I'm not Antifa a good or a writer. Most of you guys are. I'm not. <laughs> yes. I try. Ask a stupid question. This is just to you, Sarah. Um, okay. Is it better to call your congressman versus email? Okay. So when it comes to reaching out to your um, congressman, the best thing you can do is talk to the district staff and you can find the information on their website. You, No matter what go. you do, you will always reach someone. If you send an email, you will always get a response back. Our staff, especially in my experiences working for three congressmen, we're dedicated to working with the constituents because you want to have a relationship with them. You want to know that your congressman has your back. So the best thing you can do is to actually go to events, email them, call them. If you have a concern, that's what the staff is there for because we're working on your behalf. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Uh, question. That's not been my experience. Mine uh, either, okay. but I like the way it sounds. It sounded good. No. Mine was, oh, thank you. Thank you. If, if, I, if I show up, they care. That's always been my experience. If I show up, then they care. I don't show up. I'm just, mm, I get the responder. That's what I've well, got. No, no, Salome, I, I you just, were going to, hold on. Salome was going to say something on this. Go, go ahead. On, I'm sorry. I cut you right, off. Uh, no, no problem. Great answer. About categorization, I think this mm. is just another facet of tribal politics and mm. i would like to add some nuance here because it's not necessarily that categories per se are wrong humans categorize things that's how we make sense of the world is by figuring out this is this it's not that what makes this different from that those are categories the trouble comes when we use categories like you said larry as shortcuts so mental heuristics to bypass actually thinking. And this is the problem that I see very often. It's that there's no desire to think. There's no desire to actually get to the truth and figure out why are these things different? What do I really think about this? Do they have a point here? That's why we use those categories because they let us bypass the thinking and say, well, I already know what someone who would tweet a anything from Trump thinks and who they are they're bad they're not smart i don't need to think any more about them boom done and that way we can maintain our worldview intact just that is it as it is without having to do any yeah. extra work of thinking getting into the details and considering why does that person think that way what is it that they see that i don't see or that i disagree with and that's how you actually expand your worldview but this is something that we've seen the media push on us the legacy media trying to paint people as black and white us or them yeah. for or against yeah. because it trains you to stop thinking and to go into the tribal brain where you're only in an us versus them mode and you're very easy to control in that state now i i make one uh, exception to what you're saying, Salome, and that it's not just the legacy media. Matter of fact, it's more prevalent and more constant, consistent on social media because it is mm. built around the internet, the algorithms that are more mm. able to categorize you and to put you into certain boxes and make sure they keep you in an echo chamber where you're only hear more of what you've already wanted to hear or have listened to. So I understand that difficulty some people may say, but the thing is we've been trained not to step out and go, but let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. Let me, we literally have been told, right. don't ask <laughs> questions, right. especially since we've been, we've gotten so bad at asking questions. And this is the problem I had with Sarah, one of the things you brought up, people are getting mm -hmm. in touch with their congressman and they fail to ask an accountable question. Right Now this is what I think is very different. We keep saying, do something. Worst thing you could possibly say to anyone in any position of leadership <laughs> is do something. Well, they'll do something that's not effective. They'll do something that's right. ineffective. They'll do something oh, that's hurts. advantageous to themselves. And they qualified and they did what you said. They did something and you, mm -hmm. because you failed to make them accountable. Do the effective thing, do the right thing. Do something that you can explain to me is a benefit to the constituents who you're there to represent. And when you do ask those questions, be very aware, you are now going to be put into a category by those congressmen. Now I've done, I've had this happen with congressmen on the left, the right, the center, uh, every candidates. I've had, I'm very well known in many campaigns throughout all of New York. By not very like though, site. Mike. Yeah, their staffs don't like me. 
Yeah, I, guess I will say, to. okay, give, here's an accountable question. You can't just give me the 30 second blah, blah, and run around the question. Give me the answer. And I think that's the qualifier people have to be prepared for. Ask that hard question, expect the answer, and expect that when you do that online, the social media is going to put you in a category that's going to leave you letting leave you feeling more and more isolated even though also there's true. a lot of people who want to ask yeah. that same question do you let me grab a couple more super chats if i could i learned the libertarian is super chatting a lot i want to grab some if i could sure, 49 sure. thank you lunatic i appreciate it everything is free knowledge and skills express your humanity as a veteran i think it means we swore allegiance to freedom and liberty i know true violence well to to I, mike is a veteran i'm a veteran also i don't know if if, if you uh salome or if, uh you sarah are veterans but uh we're all veterans and we all did swear an oath and it wasn't to individuals it wasn't to protect people it was to defend the constitution it was to freedom and liberty it's true and um yes his his statement is accurate um he goes on to say one more just now, just know they know everything about you. That's true. He's not wrong. He's he's not he's not wrong. He's not wrong on that one. And his last one is: Show me the bill that eliminates all the BS policy that impedes your existence. Um, there are literally thousands of them that equal that, but there isn't one. There are thousands of bills that make us irrelevant, um, but not one specific one. Uh, so a lot of stuff I want to throw out there. Sarah, go ahead. You were looking at me like I'm crazy. Go ahead. Tell me, please. Oh, no, 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 no. I was just having flashbacks to my congressional days. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was with Jody Heist for a few years, and I started in 2020, right before the election integrity movement. Is she Nebraska? Um, Jody Heist is former congressman from Georgia 10. Oh, Georgia. Sorry, I thought it was Nebraska. I'm sorry. No, you're my, good. Oh. You're good. Joni Ernst, you know. And, um, That's who I was thinking of, Joni Ernst. Yes, Thank you. That's yes, what I was another of. veteran. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I remember I, that. Okay. So I'm very, very familiar with that whole sort of thing. Um, one of the big, I okay. So one of the big things I've realized about my personal politics over the years is that I have to take a step back from watching the news 24/7. It's literally my job mm. as a publicist, as a political commentator, to go on TV, put people on TV. But I realized after a few years on the Hill, I didn't know why I believed the things that I did. Um, so I grew up in a very political family, so it was always like open discourse. We would watch everything right, left, just to figure out why we thought the way that we did. And working on the Hill really gave me insight as to how you, especially how you talk to constituents, like Michael was saying, like, it's hard to have a good relationship with staff. But one of the things that I really appreciated about a specific member of my team who had actually been with Jody since day one, he, um, okay. his, name's, his name's Nathan. So Nathan was the legislative director until the end. Like he's one of my closest friends in the world and he's the best at talking to people who disagree with him. And any chance that you get, no matter, especially to the viewers, if you call your congressman, it will, your concerns will be listed. And so he, if you just talk to the staff, the congressman no, I, will I find out what you're upset true, about. Right? And this, this, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of Congress. I've, I've met many of them and to be, to be mm -hmm. very forward, many assemblymen and, and Congress and congressmen and Michael, you know, I'm right. Many of them are empty suits. Um, many of them are not all yeah. that's not, yeah. that is not a blanket statement, but a lot right. of them are empty suits. True. And what, and with that being true, if enough things get listed, they will react because you're right. Enough things got listed. Mm -hmm. Oh, they, this must be important. I'm an empty suit, but because my staff came to me and listed the same thing 25 times, I guess I better go do something. So exactly. yeah, I completely and agree with you. Especially when you go to earmark, earmark season or you have an August recess where the member spends the entire time in the district. A lot of the people that yes. I've worked for um, are completely against earmarks, but it is what matters for the district. And even from the staff level, you just, one of the biggest things about Capitol Hill is that we say- Hold on, for Washington those of you who remember earmarks are, earmarks is when the money comes. Earmarks <laughs> is how your district gets cash. That's where the money comes exactly. from. That's what he means. Exactly. Earmarks. The projects so, in your, ahead. if there are potholes, local colleges that need funding, it'll show up in the minibus, the everything like that. So do your research, know what you care about. Exactly. Always research. 
But one of the big things that I've noticed is, and we all say, the government is run by 30-year-olds because the congressman is running between election season, office, committee hearings, bill tax. Yep. They don't have time to read every single thing about every single meeting. So the staff is the one to research, to brief them, to write the initial bill text, and to work with the committee on their behalf. So when you talk to the congressman, he will know completely everything you're talking about because of the staff and how hard they're working. But see, that's why I said you have to ask a question that is accountable about right. a specific issue and because then you'll get or you will cause that person to actually right. react to it. I, I, Sarah, I know the number used to be that if they saw most congressional members, if they saw between 30 to 100 tweets about a specific issue, then that would elevate that issue into their talking points or into their communications with their community. I think those mm -hmm. numbers may have changed a little bit. You may be more familiar more recently, but I believe it's still consistent that there is a threshold number, I, and it's relatively low. It's like 50, maybe 100, maybe, maybe 200 of interactions on social media that mm -hmm. as soon as they see that, they're like, because they believe if one person's doing that, there's another thousand people that want right. to say it, but they're afraid to. And right. that's but I'm going to go one moving. step further, though. Hold on. I got to touch this piece. I think it's important. And this is what J Justin here says. He says the two party system is responsible for most of the fear and anger. And here's why I want to bring this up. Because even if I'm the guy and it's me, it's Michael Salome, and we are getting upset and we're going to let these people know. And now Congressperson X understands this is an issue. But Congressperson X's party says you are not to touch this issue because if you do, we're gonna make sure your fundraising all of a sudden gets uh, sopped up to nothing. We're not gonna give you access to the people you want access to. And you might not get that position that we promised you if you don't talk about this issue. In fact, we might primary you if you talk about this issue. And all of a sudden what I see happen is because of the two party system, that person's screwed. If they don't do what the party says, they're in trouble. And what they'll do is simply ignore the issue, shut the person down. I see it, I see it here in New York with uh, specifically with Democrats getting yelled at about democratic issues they're not, they're not giving the, the people who are further left in the city. And so what do mm -hmm. the people Democrats do? They stop meeting people. They simply stop communicating. They just shut down. Am, am I wrong here? Yes, to an extent. Because if the if the if the elected official isn't getting feedback that they can point yeah. to for their party and say, no, no, my constituents are here, then that, that gives them the room, the literally the negotiating room with their party and with the opposition party to actually try and move that issue forward. Again, this is why I count. This is I what now we're seeing about. that. What? Give me one example of that. I've never seen that. When the uh, we can say with Joe Manchin when he was fighting against one of the uh, one of the tax bills. I believe it was the Inflation Reduction Act uh, from the Biden administration. He was against it. Why? Because of his constituents. They said we're going okay. to actually run. He was literally you. retiring, he care. and he was the only and he was the one vote that mattered. No, okay. no, him in, and Siena. It was when, actually when, him when, and Siena. So who also two. retired? Who also retired? So but when you're retiring, yes, I'm ultra powerful then. Yes, but how many people were actually stepping up to, again, the the constituents surrounding Sanima, the ones surrounding uh, Mansion, were actually actively speaking about this and wanted them, gave them the fuel to say, no, I can say. I can I'm say something. Me, you're on my side, we person, have aren't Rand, you? Come on, Rand now. Paul's constituents do the same thing. Come on. There's a few of them. It's just not very Tell me, jump in and save me here. I know he's wrong. Selma, I don't coming. see it. I don't see it working. That's the thing. I imagine that this would be more effective if that was the mechanism by which we could enact pressure. We've been around as a country for a while, and we've had mass communication for a, quite a while now, too. And, and like you mentioned, I, I'm sure those tweets and things like that do add pressure. 
But I worry that the thing is that mechanism, that top down mechanism by which we're seeing with the TikTok bill, by the way, a lot of people called their local uh, politicians in dissent against it. And the author of the bill, Mike Gallagher, I believe, Mm -hmm. came out and said, this just proves why we should ban it because everybody's so mad. We must need to ban it then. So I just worry that when they have the will of what they want to do, like you said, Larry, when that's just a no-go, it's a no-go. And that's the problem with this kind of system where we don't really have that much influence as voters, as constituents, increasingly so in my opinion. Uh, and, and I here's completely my, here's my agree. See, you against one, Mike. You're wrong. That's fine. I, I, I'm, not, I'm used to people being against me. Uh, here's, here's, uh, here's my counter to that because you are often right, but it's because of, and I'll use this example, the Michigan primary. I was talking about this with you, Larry, before. Uh, we saw that 101,000 progressives under uh, Rashida Tlaib decided to vote in uncommitted. 100%. Now, if you look at the that was primary, powerful. huh? That was yeah, powerful. That, yeah, and so Trump in the Michigan primary had 759,000 votes. Biden by himself had 632,000. The 101,000 is what he needs to be competitive in Michigan, a swing state. And they held that back. It was a statement which was based on the uh, response to their accountable question. What are you doing about Hamas? How are you helping Hamas? Now, I don't agree with it. I think it's absolutely stupid, but they took the next step. See, it's not just ask the question. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, answer, no, no. You, you, you have walked into my economy. trap, Mr. Vasquez. You have <laughs> oh, walked God. squarely into my trap. Yes, you're right. 100,000 people literally said, you better do something. We and don't like you bombing Hamas. We think it's terrible. Don't bomb Gaza. Don't That's do this. Don't said. support Israel. That's 100,000 people said. basically said, yes, they, they said that, no, right? No, no. And what did, and how did Biden change? Wait a minute. Oh, he, he didn't. Port. He's building he them a fort right now. And he no. sent, no, 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 don't, you can't he say that. He did nothing. He's, no, what's happening is two days after that in the State of the Union, he came out and announced that he's building a port for Hamas, that he's going to be sending over funding. He's been fighting about the funding that he's trying to give to Hamas. He's already given them $100 million. He wants to give them another $300 million. And he's trying to convince the rest of the world to give them money. I mean, we're giving money to terrorists because 100,000 people were necessary. Always got to yell about Hamas. Every time you want to show you yell about Hamas, every time. What's that? One of the things that we need to think about here, though, great point from Larry circling back to just circle with the Hamas, is that people are coming up and activists are coming up to AOC and yelling ceasefire now and she's being silent. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, we it's not just about like, oh, it's uncommitted. It's funny. But there is so much infighting with the Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. I just look at Biden versus the progressives like mm-hmm. AOC now. Sure, she's a progressive, but she isn't radical like Rashida Tlaib. There there is such a huge difference. And if we circle back to the TikTok thing really quickly, too, it's just like a lot of people get upset. Look at all the kids calling Tom Tillis's office, for example saying that they were wanting to assassinate them. Like that is so illegal and people don't know that. Like Mm. they could come Mm. knock down your house and you could go to jail. But if you, you have to take the time and back to the initial point about education is to understand all of these different messaging opportunities. Like sure, ceasefire now, a lot of the Democrat propaganda sounds great. Ceasefire, nobody wants this to be happening, but it happened because of the attack on the Israeli music festival. It was completely, you know, they were provoked. So of course they fight back. So what is AOC supposed to do and just go against all of that in all of her squad members? You know what I mean? It's, there are just so many different messaging problems. And especially with the squad, for example, they align on so many other but, issues. But, so but she's not coming issue. out and talking about it. AOC is my congressperson, right? I know. She's my congressperson, literally. Feel bad for I, you. Accept, I accept your condolences. She literally is my congressperson. That's true. So I do know that they want her to be more progressive. The people in my district want her to be more progressive. They want to be more like Rashida said. They absolutely do. They really do want that. And what I'm upset about is not that I want her to be that, but people voted for that and they should get it. Whether I agree with it or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. People voted 
for her to be radical. They voted for her to be heavily progressive. They voted for her to push things like Medicare for all, right? These are things that I'm not for, but damn it, you voted for, her. she won, she should push it. And mm -hmm. I should be going, no, don't do it. And she, I don't do anything. She does nothing, right? She just sits there and just says, and she just does like Vogue magazine or something and does like a lipstick thing on TikTok or something. But she doesn't actually do anything, right? And that's the bad part. We should, she should be fighting for these things. There are people in my district, her district, who want her to, and they don't. But let me grab, I gotta, I gotta go one more, I'm sorry, I got a lot of super chats. Yeah. I'm gonna be getting my super chat people. Of course. Little Dick Libertarian, you are throwing it. Thank you, my friend. To invoke life, liberty, pursuit of it. You reject death and the destruction of your fellow man by default. Be the skilled solution if death is offered. Odin's hall awaits. Love each one. What I think he means by that is we have to fight for the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And if we die by doing that, it is a valid and good death. I think that's what he's saying. Um, I'll take it that way. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I'm on board. Like, I'm on board. I agree with <laughs> if that. I, we, we all got to go. If I got to go that way, that's not a bad way to go, right? If I, that's not a bad way to go. I'll grab Ryan real fast. Ryan a, is, a, is a member, and he says, Biden hasn't changed since 1926 <laughs> when he was 38 <laughs> years old. <That's> <laughs> so, yes, that's true. By the way, let me talk to the audience if I could. Mm -hmm. If you like what you are seeing, do me a favor, click the like button. It does matter. You are seeing people who are super chatting. If you're watching on Larry Sharp YouTube, you can super chat me right now. It gets right to the front. Absolutely. If you're watching this on Twitter, please retweet this. If you want me to care about you even more and support the show, you can by becoming a member on YouTube. 49 per month. Just click join, become a member. All good. But more important than that, please follow these people here who are giving us a good time tonight, this evening. You can follow on Twitter if you want to. You can follow Sarah on Sarah. Is it pronounced Celeb? Yes, Celeb. I got it right. Sarah Celeb on Twitter. Yes. And also, <laughs> one only Salome Sibonet. You can follow both of them on Twitter. And you also can follow Mike on Rumble at no sound bites allowed. In addition, right now, if you want to see what Salome is writing, you can check out what she's writing on wetheblacksheep.com. Check her out there. You can go check out some really cool merch uh, that Sarah's selling at 19, nine, not 917. Sorry, that is actually the area yeah. code for uh, Manhattan. 917strategies.com. And you get 10% off if you go to code, use code Larry10. 10% off on her cool merch. Please do that if you would like to. So I do want to go back, if I could then, to a bunch of comments. A lot of comments are popping up here. I do want to grab some more of these before we keep going. Yeah, people um, are One talking. of them is, John says, Larry, I'm not sure if it applies, but it could. Do you remember when drive-in movie theaters were getting into trouble for subliminal advertising? I'm giving my age away. John, you too. Um, is TikTok doing a similar thing? And the idea is, is TikTok doing a subliminal message to our kids, to our adults, is that the issue and is that why we should ban them? I get the concept completely. I still don't like the banning. But go ahead. Am I, am I wrong on this? It's not subliminal. It's overt. <laughs> That's and what I was going to say. Right. <laughs> Me too. Media. So, I mean, we, yeah. we've seen that. What? Uh, in November, YouTube said that they were going to be injecting into everyone's feed, uh, every user's feed, uh, their approved sources for news, whether you want it or oh. not, just in time for the 2024 election. Fortification, um, we see that Google has changed the way that they're doing search algorithms to inject their approved sources rather than the best source or the best ranking source. We've seen that uh, TikTok has the same thing on their preferences, on what they want to push. How many times have we seen, um, actually every year since 2018, all of the major social media companies are going in front of Congress talking about, yes, my algorithm isolates this entire class and group of people. It's an error in the algorithm. We didn't know it was happening. Well, it happens every year. And surprising you know, that everyone's doing it and every year, but we don't know. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Actually, the... go ahead. So Katie Pavlich actually exposed this the other day. Um, if you go onto your Instagram specifically, which I was surprised about, um, being in politics, follow a lot of political people. If you go into your settings on your homepage and you go down to the bottom where it says um, content access, usually it'll say like limit political content. So Instagram is mm. specifically trying to get rid of political content from your feed. 
damn you. Well, how they stuff. know if it's political? I mean, unlike if, unless you're someone like, like we're in trouble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you know, we're Larry, where we are declared political commentary. But I can tell you that how many videos do we see where someone's talking about talking about movies, talking about TV shows, sports? You know, we Aaron Rodgers was going to the rumor was he was going to be the v, uh, VIP blah, VP for RFK Jr. It wasn't real, but that was the rumor. Well, that's yep. entertainment. I mean, mm. how do you, you can't take politics out of life because no. politics is right. life. Especially yes. since there's the common leftist slogan, the personal is political. So very quickly, Ooh. that would adapt out and just become everything is political. We've had it with cooking. You know, if you yeah. cook the wrong recipe from a different race or a different ethnicity, that's a cultural oh, that's appropriation. Right. And now yeah. you're embroiled right. in a political scandal. So the idea that um, tech companies can isolate political content or moderate that that would just very quickly spread out to be everything which they probably already do largely but this was a very overt move by hiding political content and now you have to go actively undo that setting or else it's by default that way well that, i think that's the way so they get to specifically target certain groups because how do we know that everyone has that checked or unchecked are they target? Does the algorithm look at all the things you've watched and then say, "Oh, you've been watching far too much of libertarians or the, <laughs> or the no such thing. The party, no such and you're thing automatically you know, more <laughs> politics for you." I mean, and politics my, is my, my worry here, though, is yeah, here is my biggest worry, though. Here, right as we do this, this just makes the hatred more, mm -hmm. and the hatred mm -hmm. is. I, almost, I, I sound terrible when I say it, but I feel like the hatred is the goal. Mm -hmm. Like they want us to hate each other. I remember this, it's a Bill Maher from like a year or two ago, a couple years back, whenever it was, he was, he was talking to two people who were both Democrats on a show and they were all mad about why do these people vote for Republicans when Democrats are, are their best interest, they're voting against their interests. Oh, these people are so dumb to vote Republican, right? They're all saying this, right? And he looks right at me and goes, don't you know why? I'm like, no, I don't get it. He says, because they hate you. <laughs> and they're not going to vote for people they hate. He actually said that. And they were shocked. He's like, well, you hate them too. You're talking. You're showing how much you hate them. So they hate you back. So, of course, they're not going to vote for you. They don't care if, 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 your, if your ideas are good or bad. That's irrelevant. They think you hate them. So they vote for the other guy because they, they now hate you. And how many I people feel like voted for Biden because purpose. they didn't want Trump? A hundred percent. I I would mm -hmm. argue that over fifty percent of the people who voted for Biden in twenty twenty did it because they hated Trump. I mean, look it's, at Christy Noam. Well, here here's the thing. It, it's like how or do not you Christy Noam. racism? What's her case? Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, Christy <laughs> Noam is, is South Dakota. Yeah. It's it's nine p.m. Yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. How do you fight racism? Knowledge. By being more mm -hmm. racist. No, what no, other no. way could you possibly do it, Mike? By being Only more Antifa racist. With, uh, Antifa and BLM agree with that, but <laughs> everyone else would say that you get to know people of that other mm -hmm. race. That one black man very famously goes to Daryl Davis. Daryl yes. Davis, the man himself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we fight that, and we've been very effective at that. Look at the 1980s, the early 1990s. We were very effective at that. It isn't good for politics which is why right. we've gone into DEI, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, right. and inclusion, which is evil, absolutely point blank evil. It is the, it turns human beings into categories and it divides us in those categories eternally mm -hmm. because now you're not just a man or a woman, you're not straight or gay, but you're a man, a woman, uh, a toaster, you're this color, that color, you have this oh, sexual okay, purpose, that one, you're tall, you're fat, you're short, it's everything. And it keeps on going because the answer is don't get to know anyone mm -hmm. outside of the categories yes. you have been assigned, except 100%. that those other groups are all bad and only your group, which is ever shrinking. So now you're mm -hmm. under threat. You're constantly afraid because you're under threat because the group you're in is getting smaller and smaller and yep. you have less and less power and favoritism, and you only have, and this is the key part, and the only one who's going to be able to help you is the government. You don't have agency. 
only the government can correct yes, it this. Does. You're the right. who created You're the right. system, yes. but now they're the ones who are going to protect you. And see, this so is let me how grab we get Austin. That he actually says exactly that. Austin says, I tried to show my Democratic grandparents LP videos. That means the Libertarian Party videos, such as debates, Larry Sharp, etc. But after one video, they decided that they are too scared and will vote for Biden anyway to keep Trump out. Mm. Literally what we talked about. Literally what we talked about. Right. This is right here. And he put this in. This was like a half hour ago when he put this, this up. So we hadn't talked about this. And he already put this up. That is that is how tough it is. Blue Moon Red Wine. I've had her on my show before. She oh. is mad at libertarians. She says, I'm going to be real. I'm not MAGA at all. But I would do just about anything to F the Libertarian Party at this point. Libertarians are the biggest psyop right now anyways. Um, I mm -hmm. wish that were true. <laughs> what? I I'm a psyop? I wish he was right. I wish I was a psyop. Because I'm not getting paid. Like, psyop <laughs> people get paid. Right. Right? They, they get cash. They got, Where's they my check? Us. Where's my check? Yeah. I wish it was real. I wish I was getting a check. It's a I, bad I deal. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Literally, well, in a two-party system, anybody that gets in the way is called a psyop often because, uh, what, we steal votes by giving people other options? Is that what it is? You know what? Honestly, this is why RFK Jr. is so popular. I mean, mm -hmm. beyond the fact that his ad and his content is amazing, he's the kind of guy a lot of the... A lot of Republicans, especially the more moderates, are going towards because they don't want the initial Biden-Trump thing we all knew was going to happen. And also, Blue Moon, thank you for all of your kind comments on um, my intelligence. I appreciate you and all of <laughs> yeah, that. that. Um, <laughs> love politics. It's my job and my paycheck. <laughs> so um, it, honestly, it just it makes sense with the polling. And you have to trust the polls. And you know, all politics is local. So you have to trust the actual data. You have to trust the science. And the data also goes to the votes on election oh, day. Hold on. So Let me touch that piece, too, though, right? Don't we, this is like my point from earlier with distrust. Don't we not trust certain polls and certain data? I remember when I was running in 2022, I forgot which one, but there was one poll. It was a Republican pollster. And that poll we can't believe because that's Republican. So clearly they're the bad guys. And this one is not Republican. Therefore, they're the good guys. So we got to listen to that poll, not the other poll. And then mm -hmm. also 2016, 2020. Polling was off 2016, horribly off. So okay. don't we have that problem also? No. The, the, one, it goes back to uh -oh. read. When you look at the poll and they say, here's the poll, read. look at the poll. At, look at the question they asked because that's very important. You can poll anything. I can get a poll that will say that you know the majority of people believe the sky is purple if I ask the right question. And, the que and that's why it's important to understand what was the question they asked. So first – don't assume because the news media said this, that they're right, because the news media, mainstream news media, have already told us that they have reporters that make up stories, that plagiarize on a regular basis, and we keep them, and they keep firing their people, but yet the New York Times is still the most credible news in America. I think Hold not. on, I'm going to give you a quick story on this. I'm a quick story to, to validate. I'm going I'm to validate what you just said. When we were running for office, sometimes we would actually put out press releases, and mm -hmm. the press releases we put out would literally be the story. We would just write the story for them. Mm -hmm. Send the pressure is you're not in your head, you do the same thing, Sarah. Right? And send her send a story out, right? And they would literally just take my press release, cross off the name of my comms person, put the name on it and print it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's very so common. I'm just validating what you're saying, Mike. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's very common. And anyone those of us in politics, we've all seen it happen before. But the public, this is where the public has to be again, this is accountability. It goes both ways. The public has to look at this and say, what was the question you asked? And the second thing is, we can also look at, well, what have, like in presidential races in particular, we've got well over nine months of trends. Any one poll can be absolutely wrong. 90% oh, of the point. time, okay. if I have for the last nine months, every poll has been leaning towards Trump over Biden, and I have every poll that says, when they ask Democrats, do you want Biden? And they come in with 70% saying no. I have to believe that Biden is losing. And then I see the primary votes. And I see that in out of the top seven swing states, four have gone for Trump. And mm. one has gone for Biden in terms of the people who showed up to actually vote. Then I have to believe, yeah, 
there's a trend towards Trump. Could that wind up changing on election day? So sure. if we happen to go into a bunch of courtrooms, change the rules at the last minute, and we have some I uh, know that. questions. Yeah, anything could happen. But I know that. they tend to be correct. I All right, let me grab some super chat. I got super chats popping them over. Please grab some super chat if I can. Ryan, thank you, sir. In my view, the reason that I disagreed with the TikTok bill was that it's a slippery slope on giving the mm -hmm. government the power to remove what you see. Thank you for the five dollars. I cannot agree more. Mm -hmm. I am so I I cannot. I don't care how they write it. I don't care what they say. In my view, and I don't care if it's libertarian in me, Blue Moon might be mad at me now for saying it, but I'm going to say anyway, I do not. I'm so against it. I, I The second that passes, they're going to start removing all types of stuff. And the worst part is, and they say, well, wait a minute, lad, no, the Chinese are going to have your information. Okay, first off, they already have it. But second, even if they have it, China can't put me in jail. China can't take my property away. China can't lock me in my house. If some American company has it, American company will bend over for the American government in five seconds, give them all the information right away, put me in jail, take my stuff, lock me in my house. I'd rather the Chinese have it. I don't care. Chinese take it. I don't want Americans have it. So I am writing something about this currently that I'll be publishing on my website, wetheblacksheep.com this week. I dove deep into this because it mm. just stinks. It is sketchy. It stinks. I do not trust that very short term prior to the election suddenly everybody's coming together bipartisan support to protect the children from tiktok no no because first of all we've had plenty of problems with social media for a long time why yeah. now why this extreme so what i found out was that um tiktok has already been housing their data in the united states mm -hmm. there was a plan called um Project Texas, where the data would be migrated to Texas to a location that would be physically in the United States, physically managed by an American company, Oracle, and approved of by a committee that would be uh, reviewed by government. So this addresses the security concerns across the board. It was already underway. And suddenly this bill comes out where we're going from zero to 100. Why are we taking the most extreme step of either you sell your company or get out? Yeah. That's extreme. And to me, this is one step away. The only justification is, well, it's a foreign adversary. It's only for foreign adversaries as defined by Congress. That's what makes it okay. But I don't even see the justification for why the government has the right period to demand that anyone hand over their company or leave the country, regardless of whether it's a foreign owned company or not. That's still a, a, an egregious level of power that they're attempting to take. Well, I'll go one step further on this if I could, right? This goes back to my idea of distrust. If this was 60 years ago, right, or whatever, and now it's Reagan talking, or it's even Nixon before he was disgraced by, by, by uh, Watergate. Any of those presidents, if it was Eisenhower, Kennedy, if they came out and said, guys, TikTok is a scourge. It's a problem. Here is the issue. Watch your children, blah, 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 blah. Americans would have been like, okay, oh my God, yes. In fact, not just that, somebody else would have made an American TikTok. That would have happened, right? That would have happened automatically. Now... We don't trust our institutions at all. We trust TikTok more than our <laughs> institutions. And that to me, I, I worry about that. But again, to your point, I, I still think it's the government shouldn't do it, but I do understand the worry and the fear. And I'll go one step before I go. I know you want to jump on Mike, one step. My okay. biggest issue is that everything that I hate about the government has come from one source, afraid Americans. Every time Americans are afraid, we do stupid shit every time. Patriot Act, war on drugs, right? War on this, war on that, war on poverty, war on air. Every war we did, every time we bombed somebody, every time we did something stupid, it was because we were afraid. Afraid Americans always makes me more afraid. I'm sorry, okay. my guy, yell at me, tell me how wrong I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not well, I'm, I'm going to clarify some points well, because the key is 60 years ago, yes, you would have politicians come out and say this or they'd say we need to do something but the public would actually investigate it and they would read the bill and they would 
have feedback. And that would cause someone to say, I'm an American and I can do it better than these foreigners. I won't let them get away with it. Now that takes yep. unity, that takes information, it takes accountability. The three things I've been talking about all the way through. And that's the big difference in today. And why do we get things like the Patriot Act? Why do we get this bill, the TikTok ban, which one of the big problems I have with it is in the wording of it, it, it doesn't apply to TikTok. It applies to websites. Big difference. Mm. It's not just an app. It applies to websites, which means they've already built in the way to expand it, just like they expanded on the Patriot Act. And I have a problem when we have unlimited expansion potential on something that is ill-defined and put yep. into the hands of government because yep. people haven't taken the time to pay attention to the details and hold anyone accountable. And we know that individuals like Senator Blumenthal out of Connecticut, they have for years now been trying to push more government oversight and intrusion onto the internet. They want to have government protecting you and your rights by censoring things that could harm you online. Mm. We can't afford this. And this is the Tic Tac ban allows that to happen, especially because of the poor wording, the poor definitions, and they want people to be afraid rather than actually read. You want to pass this bill? You want support? Fantastic. Give people the bill. Give them more than 24 hours to actually read through it because obviously no one in Congress knows what this thing says because they're not mm -hmm. reading it. They're just voting. So we need information. Okay. We need accountability. So tagging in on that, the, one of the problems that we have um, on the congressional side, I mean, we all understand this, is that with Congress, there's so it's so normal to have these monstrous Frankenstein bills push forward yes. at two in the morning and they're 10,000 mm -hmm. pages long and they're expected to vote on it 3 p.m. the next day. So yep. I've been through this personally. Um, it's absolute hell. And so a lot of the time, you have to break it up and still read it. But mm -hmm. are the constituents going to be able to read it? Like, do we know that it's going to drop at 2 a.m.? Or is it just the congressmen and the staffers who find out? So take that into account when there's something like the omnibus versus earmarks or mm -hmm. the ag bill versus like a messaging bill. With the TikTok ban, it, it's kind of gray space for me. I'm very against the idea of controlled content in like infiltrating um, younger kids and stuff like that. Like there are so many problems with it, but I do believe that there should have been more collaboration on it instead of just dropping it. Like Salome said, where it's like, there are so many things so close to an election. And truthfully from the committee angle, I've worked with the committees before, they are very, very good at the back and forth, but it's probably a public awareness about it that's the problem. Like the fact that I found out recently that when you go into TikTok and you say a green continue, you're also giving them access to own your notes, your mm -hmm. photos and other things like that. Sure, it's a big problem. And it's very similar to some of the other things we grew up with, where it's the constant um, entertainment, like maybe just Twitter for us. But it, it there's so much of our culture built around that, whether it's jobs, mm -hmm. education, Recipes, no, like stuff uh, like all that. agreed. So, I'm, I'm not fighting you on any of that. I don't yeah. think I completely agree with you. My issue is, I, this goes back to what Michael said. Why aren't we as Americans going, wait a minute, that's, I don't want that. I'm going to make a cooler TikTok that doesn't do this. Or I'm going to make a TikTok that does this, but lets you know that or allows you to own this or whatever the case may be. What we're doing is we're, instead of saying, let's fix the problem, we're hitting it with a stick. Well, that is my issue. We're doing worse because worse. Yeah. Here's something that back in 2017, I actually published a, a video on this. I have evidence of it. Uh, when you sign everyone who's on Facebook, everyone who's agreed and has a uh, profile on Facebook, you probably haven't gone through the three internal check boxes you have to get into to uncheck the right of Facebook to arbitrarily and I didn't randomly turn on your camera and your microphone. And I've mm. actually caught them doing it. And if, if you don't know what to look for, and if you don't happen to be there that moment and catch it, you'll miss it. 
but they do. You've given them the right. You have to actually go in, and it's like three different uh, subsections in to find the one checkbox, which is deep in there, to uncheck now that. Now i got to go on my Facebook right. and check some stuff out now. you got to yeah. be scared, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> and we know that Facebook is doing it. We know that Alexa is doing it. This is why when you go onto your Facebook and you suddenly go in and suddenly all the ads are exactly what you were just talking about or what you were just looking at on the internet, it's because they have the right to turn on your microphone. They have the right to turn on your photos mm. uh, and they have access to that. But no one paid attention. But why are we talking about the TikTok ban when we see Facebook and they're not, all of the social media are doing the exact same thing. It's just that TikTok is Chinese. Well, I don't want the Chinese dude. I don't want any of the companies to do that. Why well, aren't we having Patty just, that conversation? Patty brings up this comment for Facebook. She says, I made a post on Facebook about an actor that I liked, and it came back false information. My opinion <laughs> on an actor was false. Damn. That's, that's a tough one right there. Patty, I'm sorry about that. I thought you get to have an opinion on an actor. I thought that was okay that you could do that. But in Facebook, I, this is your, to your point, Mike. You know what probably happened? They turned her microphone on. And she says something super sexy about him, and she's like, hey, "That's gotta come off." That's, that's what it was. Patty's all, all liking somebody a bit too much. I think that's it. Yes, I, I think that's the problem. Yeah. But it's 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 a valid point, right? It's a valid point in that if we don't if we don't know what they're doing and we don't care, right? then they can get the information they need and then use it against us. And that is my biggest issue. I think many of us don't care what minor things, like most people are happy that whatever, Amazon is using your information to know that you prefer blue socks compared to white socks or something, right? So most of us don't mind that. Oh, you like you know chocolate instead of vanilla or whatever, right? Most people are okay with that. But that's not what they're using it for now. Now they're using it to target information that goes only to you so that only you get you get the stuff that makes you hate. And the other person who you hate gets the stuff that makes them hate you. And now, as long as they, they, they brew this hatred, instant, instant Defense says they always want to brew hatred, it's the game. Now, what happens is I no longer have to do anything. All I have to do is protect you from the evil. And we saw what that guy talked about. He was afraid his grandparents are going to vote for Biden, not because they think Biden's great, not because they think he's going to help them, but because... Trump is, is the evil one who's going to kill their kids or something or whatever, right? So they have to vote against Trump. And I hear that every single time. I feel like division and hatred is what's doing this more than anything. A a a am I just fooling myself here? No. Um, we talked about this before the show, but one of the big problems, I've worked on this a lot, um, especially with the book that I'm working on that's coming out this next week, um, so my, my former boss, Jody Heiss, is releasing a book called Sacred Trust, Election Integrity mm. and the Will of the People. And in it, this is actually one of the big things I learned in his office. Um, when you think about a lot of the problems in our country, it's because we have a deep rooted moral crisis. So a lot of the systemic issues right. that we see, whether it's um, Antifa burning down the police precincts, election integrity, stolen elections, et cetera, et cetera. There's just no moral compass anymore. You can kind of do what you want and think that you can get away with it. So there's just no accountability, like circling back to what we were saying. Nobody knows what they can't get away with anymore. And everybody's just free willing. So when you think about like a lot of the issues, um, that are happening now do we still have the kitchen table discussions do we still have the kitchen table issues that candidates would run on exactly well, look here's the part that i want to let me give you some pushback on this sir okay i don't think oh. there is no i don't think there's no moral compass i think they believe that they are morally just in other words that's a good way to put it i believe right that these guys are so evil and so bad and so horrible that anything, it's an existential threat. No. So therefore, anything right. I do, lie, cheat, steal, harm, doesn't matter because this is such an existential threat. Right. Like, I can kill somebody that's trying to kill me, right? I can commit, I can commit murder, but it would be murder because it's self-defense if someone's trying to kill me. So I don't actually think it's a lack of this. I think it's the feeling that it is validated. No. Am I making sense? Yes, but I think you've got it in the oh, wrong order. Yeah, no, again. 
Well, no, you got it in the wrong order. Okay. It's that the morality, the moralization and justification come after the action. They take the action first because the action has been indoctrinated. It has already been approved. They have been told that they, these are the things they should be doing. Because the conversation we have had so far today, there is someone on the left screaming at me right now saying, oh my God, microaggression, microaggression. And in, they have been taught that microaggression is violence. Therefore, they are justified to try and punch me in the face because it's microaggression. And after they have punched me in the face, well, then their morality is, well, it's because you're a Nazi. Now, I bring that up because I've had that happen when I've run, I've run for office twice. And I've had a mob of 100 people telling me how much of a... Nazi I am to my face and, and surrounded, ran away the entire news media and threatening physical violence against me for simply saying, you know what, the police in the, I was in upstate New York, the police in the community I was in had for four years never committed a uh, assault or a police brutality against the community. That was documented. That was a fact. They had the body cams to prove that. And I said, that's a great example of them doing their job, doing it well, and maybe we should see that across the rest of the state. And for an hour, I was surrounded by members of Progressive Leaders of Tomorrow, a offshoot of Antifa and BLM, that were surrounding me, telling me how much of a Nazi I was because of that. Were you wearing your armband or no? Not that day I wasn't, no. Okay, not that day. Um, okay, good, okay, good. All and right. and, I, loved the, and I loved when uh, the young white women were telling me that I wasn't black, looking me in the face. I'm like, I've had wow. that happen before. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, I've mean, had that happen before. Yes. But they're doing, see, but they did that, and afterwards they then went online and justified it because they were morally right. See, so they do it, yes. and then they justify it. Yes, but they're, it's, but again, it's just because they, you know, when they're calling you a Nazi, as dumb as that sounds, they actually believe it. Like they aren't, they aren't doing it because it's a joke. They are, they actually believe it. They can, I've been called a black, white supremacist. And the people t calling me that honestly believe that. They're not, they're not trying to make me angry because they just want to say things, right? They honestly believe it. So I think that they, they're overlap. Let me, let me go off if I could for a second and, and, and validate these polling things. You, you've got some people going, Michael, with your polling stuff. Um, Patty says, I took a class in college. <clears throat> we had to create a poll that proved the point given to us. Mine was more children are being named untraditional names. So I went to a hospital in Woodstock, New York to prove it. It depends on where slash who you poll and the wording of your question. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then Dave goes on and says, Poll question. Trump eats burnt babies for breakfast. Biden does not eat burnt babies for breakfast. If election was held today, who would you vote for? Trump, Biden, or other? That's exactly correct. Yes, that is a perfect poll question. Well, Thank you, that, Dave. There's that Love classic that. one that they say, um, what is it about uh, beating your wife? Um, do you know what? It's the question. God, it was in Oh, yes. Interview. Have you stopped beating your wife yet? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. How do you answer that question? Right. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that libertarian lady then says there's a book called Lying with Statistics. Everyone should read it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you. Yeah, you do keep going. You, you were right. You, you took it like 14 people. <laughs> so, yes, with that one. I appreciate that. I, I have a say. tendency to do that. <laughs> I, I only triggered one and she's still after me. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Me off. You there know we what? go. Let me say this. In the, in the chat, anyone watching the video, I say this on my channel all the time. I don't care. Personal, you, you have a personal beef, that's yours. Keep it. If you have a question that's like on the issues, fantastic. You think I'm wrong? Fantastic. Tell me why. Cite the sources. Let's have that conversation. You tell me you think I'm ugly or old or something stupid like that. I don't care. Keep it to yourself. Stop that stuff. Oh, Let actually, this is a good plug. Fast. Okay, huh? wait, go, ahead, go, I, go, go, go. Okay, cool, cool. So um, one of the things that I just launched on my store today um, on 917strategies.com, um, there's a code Larry10 for 
10% off all of the merch on my website. Right, the Blue of the Moon, yep. right there. Blue Moon Red Wine, this is perfect for you. Um, there's a mug that says, I think you're wrong. So <laughs> it's a personal favorite of mine. Dropped it on TV when I was much younger. And it's just a good way to say, you know, middle finger to you, but let's say it nicely. Yeah. There well, you there go. we go. And hold on. And there it is. I think you're wrong. A woman's place in the House and Senate. Motion to vacation. Right there for you. See, a whole bunch of cool stuff. Shirts, right? Look at all the good stuff. There we go. All good. Have fun with Hoping us. for approval. Heard my last email. All good stuff. See that? All good. So Thanks. she does have some cool things. If you want to enjoy them, please go ahead and enjoy them. There we go. So, but if you like what you're seeing, guys, please click the like button. If you haven't already, please click it. It does matter. Wherever you're watching, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Twitter, if you're watching on Facebook, no matter where you're watching, please click the like button. It does matter. It's how I get past the Al Gore rhythm. I got to say it separately so I don't get in trouble. But yes, that's how I get past it. Absolutely. And of course, you can super chat me. I have more I'm going to go through. If you want to on YouTube, you can uh, also retweet this if you're watching on Twitter. You can become a member if you want to. Membership always makes things better for me because then I know the cash coming in. I can do more of this. Click join at 49 per month. You can join on uh, YouTube. I also mentioned, obviously, already, you can head to 917strategies.com slash store if you want to pick up some cool merch. You can also read what Solid Bay is saying. I said she's my talking head. She is. It's true. We <laughs> black sheep.com makes that happen. But no matter what, please follow everybody here. You can follow on Twitter, Sarah Selop, Salome Sibone, or on Rumble, no sound bites allowed. So uh, keep going, Sarah. I'm sorry. You want to go keep talking? Go ahead. What was I talking about? I talk a lot. <laughs> no, that's, oh. don't, don't we all? Let me uh, then, if we're going to go there, let me quickly grab another one if I could. Back on the polls. Oh, cool. Ryan, but you just brought the polls up, Mike. They're all over it here. Okay, yes. Uh, Ryan I think says I did. the only poll. Oh, was that you, Sarah? I'm sorry. It was that Sarah was me. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. No. Was, Michael can have the blame. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> oh, my, it's all Michael's fault. Ryan, thank you for the five bucks. Appreciate it. The only poll that I trust is the one held on election day. I will thank the 2000 election for that lesson. It's a valid point, right? It really is a valid point. Um, the election does matter. However, I think you're right. We have to sit back and realize you, you got to know where you're going, right? You got to know where you're going. Polling does matter. It absolutely does. Polling does matter. In fact, I would argue that polling matters for one very important reason. I'll go to my libertarian roots for this, right? The getting in a poll, if you're in a third party, if you're a Green Party, Libertarian Party, RFK Jr., whomever, just getting in a poll makes you valid, mm -hmm. right? If you're in a poll, you're valid, right? I, I'm valid only because if you go to 538.com right now, put my name in, I'm listed in polls. Otherwise, I'm some dude. I mean, I'm still like some dude. But now I'm some dude who's been polled, damn it. So I'm a dude who's been polled. So I actually have polling in New York State. It does matter. People take you more seriously, even if you do poorly, right? If, if you're a Republican or Democrat, you have to do well. Or if you're a third party, you just got to show up, right? I mean, I was only polling my highest, like 6 or 7% was my highest. But polling at 6 or 7% in New York State as a libertarian is a big deal, right? If I'm a Democrat, I'm a loser. If I'm a Republican, I'm a loser. But it does matter. I just think, I just think it is. I don't know. Am, am I all? Simon, you haven't mentioned polls. Do you care about polls other way? I'm not much of a poll person myself. You guys are the experts on that. I notice what's going on. I hear the anecdotal evidence and I kind of observe on the ground. I'll take in the polls when they come in, but um, I don't know. I have my own my own ways. There we go. I like it. I, I get that. I mean, it, <laughs> the fact is we put too much credence into polls, but where did the polls come from? They come from the approved media. Where yes. does the approved media come from? They come from colleges or institutions that have indoctrinated them into a certain mindset. That's why 90% so, of our media is left leaning. So, so hold on, let me go to that piece, Mike. You bring my verb, which I want to bring up again, right? This goes back to my distrust piece. Right. I remember, I mean, when I was younger, mm -hmm. if some guy came on TV and he had some PhD from some college university, we were like, oh, that guy must be right. He's wearing a bow tie and he's a doctor so-and-so from so-and-so university. Whatever he says must be true. Now we're like, eh, 
maybe, and maybe he's just some knucklehead who just has an agenda to push. We, we don't necessarily agree anymore. I feel it's a huge issue. And in theory, at least, if we're paying tens of thousands of dollars every year to go to these colleges, and we're putting all this money in these colleges, shouldn't we think that these professors are smart or savvy or right? No. No. The, what's that guy, uh, the science guy? the nerd who used to teach Bill Nye, the science guy? Bill Nye. Yeah, yeah. What's his degree in? Do you know? He doesn't have one. I don't think he does. Communication. He's like a, he's like a, engineering. He was, he's, yeah, engineering. he's like a, he's like but, a comedian. He was like a comedian or something, wasn't he? No, no, no. He was, he was in science and he was okay. engineer. And then he's talking about climate change, which he knows nothing about. See, there's the problem. I have a PhD. Fantastic. Does that mean you can talk about everything in the world? No, you have a PhD in a very specific field on a very specific subject. Fantastic, you're great. I hope you can make money at that. They can't, but that's besides the point. But now they were talking about things they have no idea about. We have, um, there's many, many examples we can point to, but the media is using that as a bludgeon. You can't talk about this. I'm sure we've all had this happen to us everyone on this panel where we were having a conversation with someone they go you can't know that you you don't know that i had i had uh, in my what live stream on sunday someone told me I, I said joe biden in the state of the union yeah he lied about the united states in terms of our inflation he goes you can't know that you're wrong what's your source well the source is the st louis fed it's the federal government itself the bureau of labor statistics i actually oh up. that's what you mean yeah, there was 14 other there are 14 other countries that have lower inflation rates right now. Almost all of them are industrial nations including the United Kingdom, uh, China, France, a few others. So there's that. There's also the fact that if you look at inflation from February of 2021 until today, inflation has gone up 18%. But, but see, the point was now these are the facts. I know them off the top of my head. I can tell you the sources. Yeah, but you don't have a degree in, in climatology, that. so you're wrong. Exactly. I'm not, I don't have a PhD. Well, you can't possibly know that. No, I can read English. I don't need to have a degree. Yes. It, you got we, Michael's on your side. Michael says, I had the same medical degree as Bill Gates. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so do I, by the way. I have the same one. I do too. Yes. That's yeah. awesome. So that goes back that. to my thing earlier that information is the source that gives us the distrust that gives us the misinformation it's that we don't have the information so we have to assume or accept when these institutions with political bias say here's the truth that we're going to tell you but it's not and it's real simple to check this sometimes i read the yeah, guardian but, the bbc yes. the new york times but my i'm going back to my point though right mm -hmm. we should and I know this is a fantasy now. We mm -hmm. should be able to trust our institutions. We should be able to, otherwise they're not our institutions. This goes back to, Michael, you brought this up and I think Sarah kind of did too. The idea of how can we be a, a nation, right? How can we be a group of people who have any sense of cohesion if we're not put together by our institutions? And the piece I'll bring up here is, I lived in Japan for many years. And when I lived in Japan, I taught English there for a bit. And one of my students said to me, to me during the class, he said, Larry, why in the world do you Americans get so mad at when people burn your flag? It doesn't make any sense to us. No one burns the Japanese flag because they did, nobody would care. We don't care if you burn a Japanese flag. We don't care, burn a flag. We don't care. That's why no one burns our flag because we don't care. And I said, you don't understand something about Americans. I said, you're Japanese. You are connected by many things similar culture, similar language, similar religion. You have a unified um, um, education system. You read the same books. You go to the same school system. You have similar history. Your country is much more homogenous than us. You are linked by many things to what, you watch the same TV, this is back in the 90s, so they watch the same TV shows, right? So they were linked by so many things. A flag had no meaning for them in reality. It was just some silly simple symbol. I said, Americans are not that. We are very diverse different schools, different languages, different backgrounds, different everything. We are linked by ideas. We are linked by symbols. We are linked by things that are up here. 
We're not linked at the ground level. We aren't. At the ground level, we're, we're actually very diverse. We're linked by things up here to include institutions. Like we should, we should support our Supreme Court. We should support our president. I said, remember something. Why in every other country in the world, when something goes wrong, until recently, people would blame the leaders, but they wouldn't blame the American president. If something goes wrong, the American president, they, they look, get behind him. Oh my God, help us. We are the only major nation to where our head of state and our head of government is wrapped into one person. Every other country that has, has two separate ones, a head of state and a head of government. Ours is wrapped together, ultra powerful. The person we get together, we, we walk behind. When you start breaking these institutions up, do you even have a country anymore? Do we care? But I'm just saying, the institutions should matter. And I feel like they don't. Did I go too far? Did I rant too much? And I'm Salome, tell me I rant too much. <sighs> the thing is that I don't care about the institutions. I don't know. They are bad. I they suck. That. That's why so, I, that's why I <laughs> picked up me. Yeah. Yep. You know, they, they brought it upon themselves. And I think this is a problem with a lot of government institutions is that they can't face consequences they don't evolve and so they just start to become hollow shells that have re increasingly damaged their reputation and show no accountability no acknowledgement even oftentimes that there is a problem and so what else can you do except say forget that i've seen that institution lie to me so many times yep. and they don't even acknowledge it they still don't acknowledge it and at that point, you would be a fool not to distrust them. But to your point, of course, then where does that leave us? And that's the real problem is where do we go from here? Right, 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 right. Josh says our institutions are broken and no one care about regular citizens. I agree. I think that's true. I, I wasn't saying it wasn't true. I was saying it's a I think it's a bad thing that we don't trust them. And I don't know how we fix that. Sarah, can we fix it or am I fooling myself? It depends what kind of institution we're talking about. <laughs> I'm fooling, I'm yes. fooling myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Like if we're looking at colleges, look at what mm -hmm. it, like the indoctrination from the top down, right? Yep. And now after that, like there are so many students who will just scream at each other all day because they're hearing it from their parents or their professors, yep. just regurgitating the talking points. So it becomes this issue where you learn this, like, honestly, probably earlier on now, younger and younger, but there's this thing called the heckler's veto. So you just scream it and scream at the other side yes. and the other side and to see who's louder. It doesn't really matter what they're saying as long as someone's being louder. A lot of people don't understand or think to or aren't educated on the context of what they're screaming about. Like, okay, all of the people with ceasefire now, do you really believe that? Or do you just like the word ceasefire, you know? Mm, so, yeah, exactly. Like and I was do driving. They understand what is what the ceasefire actually is or isn't? Do they understand it, what the value is or not? Or are they just like, oh, we're yelling ceasefire now? Yes, okay, let's all yell ceasefire, right? And we don't know why we do it or even what. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's a good point. It just makes no sense, honestly. There are just all of these buzzworthy words, buzzworthy phrases that people just want to use on Twitter, put them in their Instagram because yes. it'll make them look more like the mob, like circling back Absolutely. to the Black Lives Matter thing too. Like, yeah. You know, the Libertarian, yeah. it says, thank you for the dollar nine again, I appreciate it. Where is the debate of thought for policy? I would argue not just policy, right? One of the things I try on this show, and it sometimes drives my crazy, is I try to bring people on the show of all different sides and everything together to chat because I wanna have a place where we can talk about things without just yelling at each other, even though sometimes I yell. But I try not to, and so that we can actually make that happen because I do feel you have to have it. What we've, and this, Mike, you bring this up all the time too. What we've done is we've made DEI the answer. And the problem with DEI, isn't that DEI is by default bad? Yes, it is. It's bad because it's not on the right thing. Diversity of thought is valuable. Diversity of physical whatever is not. Right, that's the issue. If you were actually looking at diversity, of, I, I teach it in my classes when I've taught in the, in the past, you know, the, the goal of any good organization should be diversity of thought with, with singularity or unity of purpose, right? That's the home run, if you can get both. The problem is when, well, this person is color X, this person is gender Y, well, now I have diversity. 
Do you though, if they all think the same and all afraid to talk and you have an environment where no one can say anything or they're gonna get fired, you have diversity of nothing. You don't have what you need. So diversity is a good idea if you have diversity of thought with unity of purpose. And my goal has always been, I want people to be talking with all ideas, trying to solve the same problem, not just to yell and be like, my side's right, you guys are dumb. I don't want yeah. to. Psycho I think psychology 101. Like literally, it's talk to someone with a different bias than yours to figure out your own bias. So you're not regurgitating the CNN talking points. I always say that I learned so much about being American by living in Japan. Mm. Well, that, 100%. And I, now I lived over in Russia, but yep. here's the thing. It, it's, it's not that we need diversity of thought. I, I, I have a problem with that in this, in this context. Dave agrees with me. You're wrong, Mike. Diversity of thought. No, See, no, you're wrong. no. Let me, let me finish. He loves to <laughs> say ahead. that I'm wrong. He loves this. I, I do you. love that. It does um, make me feel good. Yes. But I'm looking to clarify because, see, there's a trap in that. Because the, we've seen some sectors of the government and certain think tanks, certain political organizations mm -hmm. will catch on to that and then they will try to mandate the diversity of thought. See, I, I don't want that. I want mm. critical thinking. Let's just make right. it really simple. And again, Put it back to the individual. I want you to critically think. Let's teach our kids to critically think. As adults, let's critically think about the issues. Again, this goes to my conversation earlier in accountability to the politicians. Mm. Well, you have to be accountable first. You have to be knowledgeable first. That means you have to think about this and have a question. That's critical thinking. And by the nature of just having knowledge and having thought about something, you will have that diversity. It's a natural outcome. But if we say diversity of thought, we have to improve the diversity of thought. I guarantee you that'll be a college course, which will be mandated, mm. and that will be another form of programming. I yes. don't want to see that. It's a valid point. Tell me you're going to say something. Go ahead. Yes. So I completely agree that there is no debate regarding thought and policy. And I think that that is reflected in our culture widely. I think that Sarah's point about how universities are training students in the heckler's veto in this idea that you can't actually engage with dissenting opinions. Mm -hmm. You just have to be better. You have to pick the right opinion and then steamroll over anyone that you disagree with. And this is something that we see now a lot of this in infantilization of the younger generation trigger words ex censorship mm. of topics that are sensitive because it's this message that you don't have the capacity to deal with ideas to be able right. to critically think you just need to take what is correct which of course someone else is telling you what that is and then you just settle with that and fight against anyone that tries to change your views this is what I'm trying to work against with my publication, The Black Sheep. So it's interesting you bring this up. It's exactly what I am trying to change. I want to bring back the culture of interest in genuine intellectual discussion. Like you were saying, Michael, that if you're coming in here with, oh, you're a racist, you're a bad person, you're ugly, that's not an argument, that's an opinion. Right. Take it to the kindergarten table. In an adult exactly. culture, in an intellectual, mature culture, people can defend their ideas. It's a skill. It's something that we should be respecting. We should be admiring. And yet we're told, like you said earlier, asking questions is troublemaking, that you're yeah. a bad person for trying to get out of the box and talk to people with different views. Yep. And so my concept is the black sheep as a symbol of the di tolerance for dissent. So there's actually a psychological study of this concept, the black sheep, by which researchers found out that if you have an in-group and you have a dissenting in-group member and a dissenting out-group member, the in-group will punish the dissenting in-group member more oh, yeah. than they will punish the out-group member that mm -hmm. dissents. Because the in-group member that dissents is more of a threat to changing the group, to changing the status quo of that group. So this actually is a perfect mechanism for those institutions that are failing and why we distrust them. Because they don't honor the space for dissent. 
Why? Because they don't want it. They don't want to change. They want to keep hold of the narrative. They want to keep the status quo. And so whenever that changes because there's some minority opinion that shows, oh, actually the narrative is changing. There's new science on this. There's new information. There's a wider perspective that you're not considering. They just suppress it. They demonize it. They suppress it. They try to scare you out of asking questions. Mm, oh, yep. if you're talking to that person, you're on their side. Maybe you're just as bad as they are. And it keeps us siloed into these different avenues, like we see a lot on social media, where you end up in an echo chamber. You don't actually yep. see the genuine argument of someone that disagrees with you. You see this straw man version of their argument. And then everybody on your side pats each other on the back like, yeah, that straw man argument is terrible. No one's actually learning. It's it's all a ritual in conformity. And so the black sheep is this concept of bringing back value to listening to the dissenting opinions, to actually trying to engage intellectually with things. We used to be great at this as a country. We used to have all these old talk shows yes. where people would come on and talk. And it was like normal mainstream TV, you know, Charlie Rose, people like this. They'd interview really egregious thinkers. Show. That's right. Now, this is it. You this is it. It's all of us here trying to keep it alive. <laughs> It's just us. But I want to I want to walk to this part that Sarah brought up and with, with you together, which is they say this is the phrase they use. When I hear things I don't like, the phrase I say is I don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's the phrase. And what? I hate that phrase because that's the phrase that says words are violence. Mm -hmm. That is the next piece, which now goes to what Michael said earlier, right? Okay, if I say the bad thing, now I can punch you. Because mm -hmm. you said the thing, I now feel unsafe. So now I feel threatened with violence. I remember um, this was uh, an issue of someone was talking about gendering. I forgot what it was. I think it was like a, it was it was one of the CNN town hall a couple years back, and someone I think misgendered someone, and mm -hmm. the woman yelled out, "That's violence!" She yelled out, "That's violence!" And I thought to myself, no, I, I think you should be gendered as you want to. I'm not against calling someone what they want. I'm not against it at all. It's fine. But it's not violence if I don't do it. If I say no to that, that's not violence, right? It could be a, I could be a jerk move if the person is my friend. That If you're my friend, I should be good to you, right? Such a jerk move. But it, it's not violence. But I think what you just said, Salome, goes to the point of people then going, well, now it's I, I don't feel safe. Therefore, it's violence. This goes to what Sarah was talking about. Now I can morally do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. I can be mean, yell, scream, attack, mm -hmm. punch, shout. It's a vicious down. cycle. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Be yeah, it's a self-perpetuating system because then, of course, the weaker I act, the more I'm justified in doing whatever I want against those that I disagree with because I just call everything harm or violence or a threat. And that just grants me this magic power to then do exactly what I want and use all force possible against them. And which something else everyone... too, I'll, I'll add to this, which is mm -hmm. if I'm, if I don't feel safe, right? Particularly to your point, if I act like I am weak, like the weaker I act, the more of a victim that I act like, the more I can encourage others to use violence on my behalf, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't feel safe because Salome is saying these mean words, Sarah, go punch her. Right. And then Sarah goes, oh, Salome's being mean to Larry. I'm going to go punch her. And now all of a sudden I've encouraged someone else to use violence on my behalf. Mm -hmm. So I'm going even further than this. Oh, Michael, go ahead, please. No, what they're going to do is use the government to do it. Because, again, remember, you don't have agency. The government will. This is the right. culture of victimhood. But I, I wanted to point out something that's been bugging me. I'm sorry if I looked weird while everyone was talking for a second. Uh, Larry, can you bring up there's a quote, uh, a statement there from Robert Reed. 10:39 p.m. What 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 10:39? Uh, what? Uh, yeah, I said. Hmm? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is kind of important because it deals let me with, read it out. With, with Robert says, but what if someone's opinion is fundamentally a racist one? Can you now not call it out because you're not being intellectual? Okay. Go ahead. So that's the question. I think it's really important because it hits on fear. It hits on distrust. It hits on education. It hits on this feeling that you're a victim and that you are not empowered to do anything. So let's really break this down for a second because I think this, if you look at this across the board for everything in your life, it kind of fits into this. 
So if someone's opinion is fundamentally racist, first of all, you just said it's an opinion. Therefore, this is your opinion against their opinion. So you may be fundamentally wrong. You have to understand that to start with. No, no, but, Are but you let's factually put the benefit correct? of the doubt. Let's assume he says something blatantly I racist. I All of group A are this bad thing, I right? He says, and obviously, objectionably, it is a racist statement. All of group A are this negative thing. Let's okay, assume that's see, true. But see, now we've changed it. So the first thing is understand, is it factual or is it opinion? Because opinion may color and change this, which is important. This is you're critiquing your own thoughts. Are you con and confirming, is it me or is it factual? Is it beyond me? So in the case, as you said, Larry, okay, let's say it's a factual statement. This is factually uh, a racist opinion. Yes. Can we call it out? Of course we can. Because whether I'm intellectual or not, I can still respond. I can always respond. You can affirm it. You can deny it. You can denounce it. You can do a lot of things. You can try and educate that person. You can try and debunk what they're saying. You are not limited just because someone said it and they have a feeling does not re eliminate your reaction or thoughts or your own feelings. We constantly hear this. Well, you, you know, they're trying to teach you feelings. They're imposing their feelings on you. You already have a feeling. I already have feelings. You don't care about my feelings. I don't care about your feelings. We all have feelings. They're transitory. They change every second. But what we can do is we can educate educate each other on how we think and what we understand how did i get to this conclusion what made that person have that racist ideology or that thought is it a misunderstanding well, this, is Darryl davis. Mm -hmm. huh? this is literally daryl davis daryl davis literally yeah. does this right people exactly. yeah he literally has clan members who he's changed by I mean, talking to them by yes. having conversations, relationships, not by yelling at them, not by morally shaming them, not by using that kind of heckler's veto where it's just, you don't get a word in edgewise, I'm gonna talk all over you and I'm gonna denounce you as a terrible person, irredeemable, I'm not gonna talk to you. If you really mm -hmm. identify someone as having a dysfunctional, destructive, irrational, incorrect opinion, the intellectual thing to do is also the most effective response because you're mm. responding with what would be most likely to change that person's opinion, which is an actual argument that shows them the, the gaps in their logic that shows them, well, you're saying this, but what if I applied it here? And what if it's this way? And, and how do you explain this? I love the Socratic method for things like this, which is just ask questions. And mm -hmm. that is also the intellectual approach, which is, okay, why do you hold that belief? Well, then what about this? Well, then what about that? And people then, that's actually the best scientifically researched way to get people to change their minds. I have an article about that on We the Black Sheep because this is a huge part of being able to have a collective, a culture that is intellectually mature and capable of reading bills and engaging with their politicians and actually thinking through things on a more complex level than just being emotionally manipulated. And that is know how to change people's minds convincingly. And it's not by yelling at them. It's not by treating them like crap. It's not by smothering and silencing and harassing them. That is actually how you do the opposite. That is more likely to entrench people in their beliefs because they think this guy's such a jerk. I really want to disagree with him. I'm going to dig my heels in into this belief. Right. right. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I, What's I, funny, you, you, have a, you have a fan. Mike has bad knees, says, what we the black sheep has everything. Yes, it does. It does. It, it does. For the does. whole family. <laughs> For the whole family. Absolutely does. 100%. Michael uh, says, uh, yep, I, Socratic method is solid at rooting out baseless claims. I got it. Man, we did good because we even got Blue Boom back. She's like, exactly, Larry. Hate is part of free speech. We got her back. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we got her back. <laughs> I mean, yes. It took us a time, you, but we got her back. Before go you go to the... Uh, the super chat i just want to say but i want people to understand when we say intellectual it doesn't mean exclusion it doesn't mean someone with ah, a degree okay. it doesn't mean someone who went to college it doesn't mean someone who's a bookworm it means someone who thinks right that means you if you rationalism thought about it then you're the intellectual in that situation having that conversation it doesn't mean you have to have some piece of paper that someone else approved of Right, that's elitism. 
Yeah, and, and I think people sometimes forget that's that authority bias. Uh, as it's a, uh, um, it's a false logical a fallacy. A fallacy, right? Yeah. It's a fallacy that you know there's that authority. Ooh, I've got mm-hmm. a degree. No. Appeal to authority. I, yes. Exactly. No, I completely agree. I'm so glad you added that. I want to add my little thing on that because we saw a lot of that during the pandemic, which is mm-hmm. don't question this because the experts know. Trust the science. Trust the this. Trust the that. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust the world around you, which you can observe. And I think that is fundamentally one of the most malicious perspectives because it is the foundation of authoritarianism. It is how you train citizens to distrust their own methods of observing and understanding their world. Everybody is capable of rational, intellectual thought and discerning truth for themselves. Elitism is the idea that there are only a few people who have to jump through specific hoops and be designated by specific gatekeepers as having the ability to articulate or decide on certain topics. But that's not what America is. America has never been about that. From day one, it was a lot of scrappy people that came here and were like, we can start our own country. We can do this our own way and we've been doing it ever since and it's worked quite well up until we had the elites start to try to run things on their own and to cut the people out and tell us you're not actually capable of understanding what's going on here we're going to censor this for you we're going to da, 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 all of this so before we go any further i want to grab a couple more things i want to grab a super chat before we do that please i want all of you to tell everybody who's listening and watching you know what you're doing what's going on for you this week what special is happening mike you want to start Oh, sure. Um, so what I do is kind of this, uh, more just me, but I go through all the news, international, all the way to the local, whether it be uh, local community or even national. And basically, I, I go long form political commentary. I remember how we got to these situations and then project how we might be reacting in the future. Um, I, and you got a show this weekend, right? Yeah, every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I go live around the world and I take as long as people want. Matter of fact, I do have one thing coming up. April 6th is my birthday. On my birthday, every year, I go at least 12 hours long live answering every question people have about politics. Any issue that's been in politics for the last 40 years, I will go into detail on it. I can answer the left, the right, center, whichever position you have on it and all the details. And I do that every year. It's at least 12 hours that I go. There we go. I've never gone 12 hours. I went eight That's hours. That's wild. Yes. It's my I went eight hours on, on New York uh, policy. It's on my website. Still, I'm sorry, still on my um, YouTube page now. I went eight hours on New York policy once. No stop, no food, no bathroom break, <laughs> nothing for eight hours straight. I've never done 12. So you beat me on that, Mike. Now I got to do more than 12 now. I got to get Every year on my birthday, every year on my birthday, 12 right. hours. And Sarah, tell us, what are you doing? Okay, so uh, Sarah Salip, hi, I'm a Virgo. Um, anyways, so um, I'm a political publicist and one of the projects I've been working on, I had mentioned it before, um, is a book with my former boss, Jody Heiss. Um, he just left Congress in 2023, but he has a new book coming out called um, Sacred Trust, Election Integrity in the Will of the People. It comes out next Tuesday and nice. will be available wherever books are sold. So expect to see a lot about it and hopefully you guys buy. But yeah, it's gonna be a really big deal. He ran for Secretary of State in 2022 and he lost to Brad Raffensperger. But Mm. one of his big things going through the process was that he realized it's not about the stolen election, it's about this is happening because of the systemic issues that put it into place. So, for example, not cleaning voter rolls. And this has been a problem on both sides of the aisle. Let's fix it once and for all for both sides. Yeah. I love it. Excellent. Salome, please tell us what you're doing. Hello. Yes. Artist, writer, speaker, and like one of your very observant (laughs) viewers noted, everything is at wetheblacksheep.com. That's where my focus is. I try to get to the very root of the problems that I see in our culture. I do a lot of social commentary on Instagram and Twitter, um, but I'm most interested right now in bringing back individualism into our culture and bringing back a culture of debate and intellectualism, Mm. and particularly a culture that values 
dissenting perspectives and learning from that. And by doing that, I believe that we can weed out the authoritarian personalities because when you have a culture of people that really believe in their ability to discuss things rationally and to get to the truth using rational methods, then it becomes so obvious when other people are just trying to bully pressure others and push their way to get what they want and so that's what we're doing at we the black sheep love it let me grab if i could head over to uh our again lunatic libertarian you are just kicking killing it tonight thank you so much for the 999 debate by eliminating labels titles and categories how many arguments do you have when you replace the ltc we know what ltc stands for no i'm not, I'm not sure. sure what ltc stands for i use human being um, oh, that's it. Labels, titles, and categories. That's oh. what it stands for. He oh, did okay. it for himself. Great. Uh, then emotions really show a human being versus a veteran, a man. I'm not sure what that is, whatever that is. But I think his point being, we should be just talking about the arguments. However, I do think there's a, there's a if, if I give a little bit of pushback on you, doesn't someone's credentials or background sometimes color how you view them or their mindset. In other words, you know, the fact that I'm a veteran may change how you see me or things that I say. The fact that I come from the South Bronx may change how you feel or how you see me. Um, the fact that my father died when I was young may change how you feel. I'm a libertarian, may change something. Isn't that also valid? No, I, I think he's talking about categories. Not, not, okay. not, not characteristics of a human being and their experiences, but mind-numbing categories that deprive you of that humanity, which is what we see in the progressive movement right Explain now. What you mean by that? Okay. So in the progressive movement right now, the worst thing you could possibly be is a straight white male. Next That's worst true. thing you could be is a straight black male. The best thing you could be is a trans, gay, uh, transhuman, transsexual <laughs> person of color who's disabled. That would be the best thing you could possibly be because that's the highest hierarchy right now. Okay. And that'll change. There'll be something okay. else they'll put in, I don't know, short, fat, whatever. It, there'll be another thing and it'll change again. Okay. So those are categories that are dehumanizing. It has nothing to do with individual experience, has nothing to do with knowledge, it has nothing to do with capability or meritocracy. It's meant to say, okay, you don't have agency, and oh, you can only gain agency. So, so what I talked about was the things, the decisions that I made versus someone putting me in a category. That's what you mean by those two things. Right. You, you, Got it. you joined the military. That was an act of agency that gave right. you a characteristic as opposed to, they said, well, you're black. So there's right. your category. There's All my black category. Men are in the same group. Right, right, right. Got it. Okay. I see what you're saying. Okay. So uh, Mike has bad knees says, I had actually never heard of We the Black Sheep until tonight, but I'm a new fan. Well, you have a yeah. fan. Thank you. Tonight. Yay. That That's awesome. You have a yes. Love that. Um, Dave says LTC is Lieutenant Colonel. It is, but not in this case. That is <laughs> accurate, but not in this case. That is true. Just not in this case. So um, Robert Reed says um, I just finished reading A Republic of Violence, a book about abolition in the 1830s. And, <laughs> Philip, and people literally tried educating people out of racism isn't that what we do isn't sure. that is isn't that what if you look at i look at that time frame and it was uncle tom's cabin For those of you mm -hmm. may not know that book that book was a critical book um uncle tom's cabin it was it was written about um basically slavery basically and how bad it was but the the bad guy in it was a slave owner he was actually a northerner who had moved down south and was extra evil and extra mean to his slaves. And that's what this was really about. And that book, to I guess Mike's point about reading, a lot of people just read it. And it really did change minds. It made a lot of people shift into from not caring, which most of America just didn't care about slavery. They didn't know if they were like, whatever, mm -hmm. it's not me, I don't care, I'm, I'm living my life. To all of a sudden saying, wait a minute, this is bad. We, we wanna stop it. I think it does work. Am I wrong here? 
I think it matters what we mean by educating people, right? Because you hear a lot of this in the left where they say, go educate yourself. You need to be educated. And it just Ah. means go absorb the correct information. It's not a genuine, right, exactly. So are we talking about education in the sense of let's exchange ideas. Let's actually have a battle of rationality and ideas here and see which idea is stronger. Or is it I'm going to educate you by telling you what to believe that doesn't work because that of course people feel offended by it it's often very dehumanizing it often bypasses the actual methods by which people change their minds which is genuinely showing them there's a gap in your logic and there's a more expansive rational correct way to view the world that will help you that can't be done by just top down here's the correct information absorb it Right, so, right, right. I bet this happens You've worked in your work with Congress um, mm-hmm. and all of the different aides there. Don't you guys sometimes just have to stop and go, and I think people should do this more often, and go, wait a minute, what are we talking about? You define certain terms, you define mm-hmm. certain issues mm-hmm. so that everyone knows, okay, we're talking about this. We're, we're starting from this point point whether it's a term uh, an idea yeah. a goal whatever it is but you identify that so that everybody knows okay this is the terminology we're using rather than everyone has their own different idea and they just go into to the wind a- am i correct oh absolutely and one of the things that i guess this i learned through building out the talking points is so let's say motion to vacate right mtv we see MTV, MTV TV, motion to vacate, or it could be a motion to vacation. Like there are just so many other things yes. that when you, when you go in and talk to your boss, talk to your client, anything, or just even like reading, you have to think about like, what is the context here? What are the context clues that can help me figure this out on my own? So I'm not assuming a certain bias here or there. And plus you don't want to misspeak, you know? So when someone says bloodbath, perhaps, <laughs> Instead of someone saying, well, if I say, you know, uh, that's not a big deal, instead of someone telling me, as in Salome's example, oh, you need to go educate yourself, which means go to Harvard and get told that genocide is okay as long as it's the the terrorists that are doing it. Instead, perhaps, as you're saying, Sarah, I should perhaps look up the article, more importantly, the video, read the paragraph of that speech, perhaps even the paragraph before and after, and then understand the context that it's as common as every single political campaign conversation. Maybe that's the best way to handle that. Am I misunderstanding anyone or did I get it right there? Let me uh, let me grab a couple more if I could. Robert, I want to first take care of Robert. He says, no, that's not what happened. In the case of abolition, it literally took a civil war. In the case of racism, it's going to the form. I, I would give you pushback on this, Robert. Big and what I mean by that is, yes, there was a civil war. That's true. But you had to get a whole lot of people willing to fight that civil war. And a lot of that was not all of it. But a lot of that was pushed by abolitionists. A lot of that was. Not all, obviously. Some people just thrown in from coming into immigrants. Some people joined for money or excitement. But a lot of people who joined, particularly in the Union, a lot of it was pushed by abolitionists. So, yes, took a war, but there was a big chunk of that that was pushed by individual abolitionists who were out there hyping it, saying this is important, you got to do this. Remember, the war didn't begin by saying it was going to end slavery, but it ended saying it was going to end slavery. And well, it that's... ended because it, it ended that way because of a lot of people, particularly hardcore abolitionists who had pushed this for years no. and had gotten enough people to say, this is true. Dude, it's no, 100% no. true. That's no. not true. No, They no. literally did a movie about let me, let me, it. Lincoln, the whole movie Lincoln. Can, can, Daniel Day-Lewis even did a movie about it. It's so true. Let me answer. Go ahead, I'm sorry. First of all, we know that it, this is the part that's wrong. It's the romantic, romanticized aspect of it. The Civil War wasn't about slavery. It had nothing to do I, with slavery. Slavery was the fifth. What? It was a tertiary issue. It wasn't one of the major issues. It was a it was a war based on economics and industrialization and the distribution of power in the United States. Yes. Slavery wasn't important. Hold, hold, People, on, hold, wait, on, hold wait, on, wait, 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 w
something that a lot of people don't think about is a week before the Emancipation Proclamation came out, and uh, Abraham Lincoln himself in the New York Times of the day took out an editorial describing that if it were possible for him to keep slavery and keep the union together, he would do so. If he had to do abolition, he would do so. It was whatever Great. was necessary to allow the union to continue as a unified uh, system. Okay. And that was the primary purpose of the Civil War. Okay. But I get, I've heard all these arguments. Let me be very clear about something. It's true. Very clear about something. There's no doubt that Lincoln initially said he wanted to keep the union together. That's true. It's why I said the war did not start to end slavery. That's accurate. But it did end that way. He did the Emancipation Proclamation on purpose. He did yes. it in 60, was it 63, was it? In 63, I think. 1863 yes. when he did it, right? On purpose. It did end the war at the end was to end slavery. The beginning it was not. You're correct, but to say nothing with slavery, no. No, economic that system. was uh, that Hold was on. not the economic purpose. System. It was a, it what was a economic carry on. system. It was the a system carry of on. slavery. No, it was what, a carry what on. What social system? The system no. of slavery. No, it was so a matter there of keeping were many the union things together. There, but come you on. couldn't keep a union together with one part of it having slavery and one part not. He had Correct. to have a unification, and the unification he decided would be with abolition and not with yes. slavery, which I'm very happy about, of course. But let's Clearly, we are both very happy about this. Yes. Of course. But let's not romanticize it, and there's a lot of factors in there, and I think I that's never the wrong way to look at it. I never romanticized it once. You took it as romanticized. I simply said it began to keep the union together and ended to end slavery. I didn't romanticize anything. Okay. You took it as that because you got triggered. Not true. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm yapping away. Anyway, I'm yapping away. Sorry, ladies. All right. Um, let, let me keep. Let me grab a couple more of these if I could. I do want to grab Roger. He says, "Larry, I've been chatty all night, and you left me for our friend Blue. So now I got to spend money." <laughs> oh, come on, it's not true, Roger. Uh, Ten dollars. Thank you, Voss. Uh, JB. Of, oh, JB of RBN is black, gay, disabled. I actually was on his show and about to be homeless. Believe me, labels don't mean jack. Is, he, is that true? He's about to be homeless? Who's Roger, JB? I didn't even know that. I need to reach out to him. Uh, JB is a, is a guy who's on the RBN, which is the Revolutionary Blackout Network. He does a show there. I didn't realize. He, I believe he has kidney issues, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's true. Um, minute, the Revolutionary Black... Uh, are those the socialists? Those the black socialists? Communists. Black communists. communists. Get it right. Communists, okay. not socialists. Communists. Same difference okay. to me. Same group. I know, but I uh, actually yeah. talk to people on the left, unlike you. So I know which ones are communists and which ones are socialists. I, I, I only don't talk to yes. communists. I've lived in Russia. I don't need more communism in my life. <laughs> there we go. So, yes. Um, but no, I think, I, I think his point is, I think his point is just because you have that doesn't mean that things happen that are you know, good. But I think what you were saying was socially. I think that's what you were saying. Is that what you were saying, Mike? You were saying this was a social issue, not an economic issue. Kind of. Um, I would need to think about which part. Okay, that's fine. I, I, no worries. I, we've been yes. talking about a lot of stuff, so uh, I'm sorry yes. if I'm missing that specific one. No worries. Guys, it's, uh, I'm going to have to wrap this up. It has been a bit. Um, anything you guys want to say as I wrap this up? Anything you want to you wanna end, end up with there? Tell me anything. Um, no, but I would just love to have your great viewers follow me on social media and check out the black sheep. It's the kind of thing that and I know, you know, this Larry, people need to be active. We need to share the ideas that matter. We need to share the information that matters and we need to help each other do that. It's really not the kind of thing, a culture war, a cultural change. A one one person can't do it alone. Five hundred people can't do it alone. It has to have momentum. And so, if anybody wants to help me build that momentum, find me on social media at my name, which I won't spell it because it's spelled out. There we go, Salome Sibone. Absolutely, Sarah. Anything before we wrap um, up? Okay, same thing as Salome. Follow me on Twitter at Sarah Salip or at Nine Seventeen Strategies. Um, we have some amazing projects coming up in the next few months. Would love for you guys to be a part of it and see what we're doing. Really looking forward to that. And seriously, use the discount code because it never expires. There we go. Look at that. All good. Mike, bring us home. Well, uh, first, I want to thank the ladies and yourself for inviting me tonight. I know it was last minute. wasn't expected. I apologize that I delayed everyone else from being able to start off on time. 
uh, my fault for that. But I appreciate and thank you for the wonderful conversation. I want everyone to go out, make sure you go to every one of their sites. Please like, share, and subscribe. In fact, afterwards, go into the comments, leave a comment as well, and say, hey, I subscribed, because that will help them a hell of a lot. And if you get the time after that, you know what? April 6th, show up. Give me a chat, a comment on my birthday, and just tell me, hey, I'm here. That's all I ask for. Here we go, guys. As I always ask you, once we are done with this and this is over, please come back wherever you're watching. Leave a comment afterwards. It's very good with the Al Gore <laughs> rhythms. It's very good with those if you want to do that. Please do that. It's helpful. Um, thank you guys for giving me a chunk of your evening. I will be on tomorrow. Uh, WYSL Rochester, New York, 1 p.m., my live radio show. I will see you all very soon.